I guess there's nothing particularly new in the idea of using water to fight fire. But as a local fire warden, I know that when it comes to fighting forest fires, water is just one of the tools we use. A mighty effective tool, never to be wasted or used extravagantly. So when my crew got together for a regular training meeting, Bert Harris, one of the state fire control men, came over to give us some instruction on the proper use of water on fire. First of all, Bert said, firefighting is a dangerous job at best. A fellow's got to play it safe all the time. Then he got down to fundamentals and talked about the nature of fire, what it is, what it does, and why. Think of fire as a triangle of oxygen, heat, and fuel. You don't have fire until there's enough heat to raise the temperature of the fuel to the kindling point. The fuel is converted into gases, which combine chemically with oxygen in the air. Result, oxidation, combustion, fire. This produces more heat, converts more fuel to gases, and the reaction continues as long as all three elements are present. But we can break the triangle by using water to cool the fuel, breaking the heat bar, and diluting the oxygen with vapor at the same time. A little water can how to use it. One volume of water, properly applied, can extinguish as much as 300 volumes of burning fuel. We've learned a lot in recent years about using water to fight forest fires. There was a time when the use of water was limited to a bucket and a wet gunny sack. The next development was the old single forester, which was nothing but a pump to get the water from the bucket to the fire. That was better, but still pretty crude. Pump and water supply were gallons of water. This gadget was more effective than anything else up to that time, but it took two men to operate it, and it was too clumsy to carry through the woods in a hurry. Today, our standard hand tool for putting water on fire is the backpack pump. With the straps properly adjusted, it rides comfortably on the back and shoulders, leaving both arms free. You use long, easy strokes. The back hand does the pumping, the forward hand guides the stream. A solid stream is used only when you can't get in close to the fire. In general, you can cool a lot more fuel with the same amount of water if you use a spray. It isn't necessary to have a spray nozzle. You can break a solid stream into a spray by using your index finger or thumb. In actual practice, Burke stressed the long, easy stroke and the proper motion in getting most effective use of the water. Water shouldn't be sprayed directly into a fire. It works a lot better if you sweep it along the fuel at the base of the flame as nearly parallel to the air. Small fire in a safe place to put our theories to the test. When the fire is too hot to get in close, you've got to knock it down with a solid stream then move in close as you can and use a spray. Remember, it's the fuel we're after, not the flame. When the fuel is cooled, there won't be any gases to feed the flame. A few men with backpack pumps can knock down a lot of fire if they get there in time. The trick is to use enough water, but not too much. When you're out on the fire line, every drop is precious. In light fuel, water can do the job with minimum help from other tools. The man with the backpack pump is always a member of the team, separates with those of his teammates. After our workout with the backpack pumps, we went over and took a look at one of the tank trucks. This particular vehicle has a 450-gallon tank and a pump operated by a power takeoff. 
It is arranged so that water can be pumped from the tank to the fire from an outside source directly into the tank or from an outside source directly to the fire. Relief and check valves near the pump take care of back pressure, prevent loss of water, and facilitate starting. Discharge valves are located on both sides of this truck for convenience of operation. The truck is also equipped with a portable pump, which can be lifted off and carried to wherever it's needed. We examined the hose couplings, the screw type with male and female fittings. The screw type couplings tightened only. The jiffy couplings can be assembled from either end of the hose. The important thing is to be sure that the couplings and fittings are of the same type and in good working order. This particular rig has hose packed in knapsacks for quick laying. Sometimes it is done up in donut rolls with both ends on the outside so that it can be unrolled quickly without kinking. With a little practice, a small crew can lay a lot of holes in a hurry. There are a number of handy fittings which can be inserted in a line. A wire connector allows the use of two lines. A Siamese unit is a Y connector with a valve on either side. It can be used to run out a branch line or as a source of water to fill backpack pumps. A bleeder valve is another fitting which makes it possible to fill backpack pumps at an intermediate point without waste or interruption. The sweat on linen hose offers some protection when it is dragged over hot coals. There are many different kinds of nozzles. The best choice in either case depends on the type of fire, water supply, and pressure available. A heavy stream should be used only when there is a hot fire and heavy fuel and you can't get in close. Just as with the backpack pumps, a spray will cool the same amount of fuel with less water. When changing nozzles or connecting additional hose, the charged line is kinked momentarily. The relief valve takes care of the added pressure while the connection is made. When water has to be pumped for a distance, especially uphill, loss of pressure becomes a problem. Water pressure drops about one pound for each two feet of elevation. Often you have to use a relay tank and another pump as a booster. Almost anything that will hold a few gallons of water can be used as a relay tank. You can easily improvise one with a watertight tarpaulin. With setups like this, water can be pumped over long distances. The portable pump is equipped with a pressure relief valve for protection in case the hose becomes kinked or otherwise obstructed. The check valve permits water to flow in one direction only, away from the pump. 
When a natural water supply is not available, a portable tank can be used for hauling in water. And we either run hose lines or pump directly from the truck. Across a highway, hose must be protected by poles and a man left to maintain the crossing. Both can be eliminated with a little ingenuity. It is frequently advisable to make a real culvert. We started a fire in heavier fuel to try our hands with a hose. Here again, the trick is to use the most effective spray along the fuel at the base of the flame down low. Water is a member of the firefighting team that can make all the other jobs easier and more effective. A hose line can cool down the fire so the hand tool men can get in close to build a line. We practiced using the Siamese unit which made it fight on two sections from the same hose line. Bring hose out of the woods at night is by working in teams. In all fire control activity, and that goes for training too, it takes teamwork and lots of planning ahead. So, Bert wound up our training meeting with a discussion of fire plans for critical areas. Strawberry Mountain was one of these. Always a headache during fire season. It's covered with brush and light timber, highly flammable during the spring. The state highway from town runs along one edge of it. The nearest source of water is a small mountain stream that's hardly more than a trickle most of the year. An old woods road runs along the other side with an abandoned section going on to Blue Lake. We really studied the map and made our plans just in case. Two or three weeks after that training session, temperature was 80 degrees and relative humidity 30 percent. And now for the fire report. The average fire burning index at one o'clock was 60 and the trend upward. No burning is permitted and all persons are warned to be extremely cautious. Palmer speaking. Joe, this is Fairview Tower. There's a bad fire two miles southeast of town on Highway 10. It's moving towards Strawberry Mountain. Thanks, Larry. Call my crew. I'll pick them up at Johnson's Corner in 10 minutes. And I'll call district headquarters and see if I can get a truck out there right away. Round up Charlie Phillips and Lloyd Foster and their crews. Ball, right round first. There's a throw in the second, and Billy Martin puts the ball on him, and he's out at second base. It didn't take us long to get there, and it wasn't a minute too soon.
My men worked hard, but the fire had gotten a good start, and they had to spread themselves pretty thin. So I was plenty glad to see Bert Harris drive up. How's it going, Joe? It's a hot one, Bert. It started down here and it's moving up the mountain and fanning out in both directions. We're doing our best to hold the flanks and keep it away from town and the summer cabins. But we need help bad. When the truck gets here, we'll send it up to this mountain stream and run out hose to hold the east flank. We'll put in a relay if we have to. There's a slip-on unit coming. We'll use it to back up your crew. I'll see if I can get another truck and a plow from Warren to the west flank. Looks like the best bet to stop the head is have Foster's crew build a line here on the summit. Here comes the truck. Harris calling Fairview Tower. Come in, please. This is Fairview Tower. Larry, I'm setting up headquarters on Highway 10, about two miles southeast of Fairview. Will you call Warrendale and have a truck sent out and then contact Farmer Smith? By the time the tanker crew had set up, Charlie Phillips and his crew were there to give them a hand. training with the Siamese unit to good use. Back at the tank truck, the crew was preparing a new supply before water of the tank gave out. Even a small stream can keep a pumper in operation. The suction hose strainer keeps debris from clogging the water intake. The bucket keeps out the silt. We now had hose lines working along the east flank. In the meantime, back in the town of Fairview, the town fire department was standing by. By this time, my hand crew had the original line under control and was working up the west flank, but they were running short of water, so the slip-on unit was a welcome sight. It gave us a hose for direct attack and supplied us with a badly needed source of water. By this time, the plow had arrived and gone right to work with a brush hook man laying out the route along the burning edge. A pump was assigned to follow the plow and put out any fire that crossed the plowed line. One little spot fire can lose the whole line. Next to arrive was the big tank truck, which pulled up the old woods road on the west flank. It was equipped with a live reel, which made it possible to go right to work. We were now bringing the fire under control on both flanks, and on the summit, Foster and his crew were completing the line to make our final stand.
Meanwhile, the first truck had worked as far as it could reach with one pump, so a portable was set up as a relay. was fighting fire with fire for the final stand. Here, too, water played an important part in keeping the fire where it belonged. The purpose of a backfire was to burn the fuel in the path of the main fire, so water should be used only to prevent spread beyond the line, not to extinguish the fire. The main fire was now approaching the summit. Up here, water supply was getting to be a serious problem, so when the four-wheel drive arrived at headquarters, it was sent around to Blue Lake with a portable outfit. from the pumper at Blue Lake to the summit. By late afternoon, the fire was completely under control, and the important job of mop-up remained. I've learned the hard way that a fire may be down but not out, and time spent in cooling off the hot stuff can often save you from coming back to fight the fire all over again. And nothing can cool it off like water. For getting down at a smoldering material, water can do a better job with the aid of a detergent, one of the so-called water wetters. The addition of wetting agents enables water to penetrate faster and deeper to stifle the flaming gases where they generate. A rake and a backpack pump make a good team on mop. At this stage of the game, there's no flame, but where there's heat or smoke, there's fire. So you have to find it, dig it out, and cool it off. When we finished mop-up, I left several of the men as patrols, and the rest of us turned to the job of getting our equipment out of the woods. Since it was still daylight, we did up the hose in the woods in watermelon rolls. The watermelon roll is started with a loop two or three feet long. After one wind has been made, it is twisted slightly before making the next turn. This process is repeated until the entire length is rolled and the loose end is tucked under to prevent unwinding. The resulting bundle is neat and easy to handle until it's taken back to headquarters for washing and drying before being repacked. Well, that's about all there is to the story of how we fought the fire on Strawberry Mountain except that I was mighty proud of the way my men put into practice the things they learned in training. Yes, it was a tough job well done. 
well done with the aid of the right kind of equipment and willing men who have been thoroughly trained in working together to keep our forests green.